Okay, and then we'll get started. Okay, I've uh, turned on the recording. Um, let's just pray together, and then we will uh, get get started. I know people are still joining. Okay, Alan Sheldon. Alan Sheldon, would you like to pray for the pray for us, please? Yes, Pastor. Please go ahead. Father Lord, thank you for another amazing day and the amazing week that we had of learning and growing. Thank you for gathering us here today to learn and grow in your word, in wisdom and in knowledge. We pray that our understanding and knowledge is increased and that we are able to retain everything we learned today, to memorize your word, to grow in sanctification, in love and sympathizing for each other, to grow in prayer. to ask the right questions and to move forward together as a group. We thank you for our pastors, our teachers, and all those who you've put in charge of us. Bless them, Lord, and guide them. Give them the understanding, the wisdom, and the leadership required to guide us closer to you. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. 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 Thank you. Thank you, everyone. And good morning. Welcome to the class. So we are studying faith. Um, Fridays and two lectures. And uh, last week we... Um, looked at uh, faith in the Old Testament. We went through Hebrews chapter 11. So we spent time uh, in Hebrews 11 and uh, highlighted different aspects of faith from the Old Testament saints, just as it is given to us in Hebrews 11. So Hebrews chapter 11, although it's a New Testament, it's a chapter in the New Testament, it's highlighting you know, how people in the Old Testament walked with faith in God and how they uh, they followed God with uh, amazing faith. And they saw God do mighty things in their day, in their generation. So today, we are going to get into lesson number six. And I put up the uh, lecture notes uh, for six and seven in the coursework, so you could um, take it from there. Today, we're going to look at the faith of Abraham. And uh, Abraham, very interestingly, in the New Testament, uh, as we will see, is called the father of faith. So usually the word father means the forerunner, the front runner, the he's like the the, the originator, the beginner, you know, the one who starts it off. Now, of course, Jesus is the author and finisher of our faith. But in an earthly sense, the, the, the God points to Abraham and says, you know, you follow the faith of that man. Uh, see the example of his faith and uh, follow his faith. So we see in Romans 4, uh, Abraham is called the father of faith. Uh, we also see, uh, uh, later, we, we will see later on in James 2, that um, uh, the, by the scriptures say, talk about Abraham, says he, he was a friend of God. And um, um, the Bible tells us to uh, be an imitator of Abraham and his faith in Hebrews chapter 6. So we're going to look at Abraham. We're going to take some time to do uh, look at his life very closely uh, uh, from the aspect of how did he exercise faith in God so that you and I will learn how to exercise faith in God. So that's our objective today. And I hope that... Um, in these two and two hours today, you and I will get a clear picture, a clear understanding of this is how I have to exercise faith in God. That 
you know, see, God gives us a promise, but we have to receive it by faith. Uh, so God may speak promises. Uh, God will speak promises to you and me from his word. So the Bible is accessible for all of us. Uh, this is God's book of promises to all of us equally. And there will also be promises that God speaks to you personally about, you know, what he wants to do in your life through you uh, specifically. So there's both the the promise of the word of God, which is available for all of us equally. And there is specific promise for your life uh, that God puts into your heart by his spirit. Now we have to receive those promises by faith. And uh, uh, that's exactly what happened in Abraham's life. And uh, we are going to learn from uh, examining his, ex his example for us. We're going to learn how to exercise faith in God so that we can receive the promises, right? So I want you to really, you know, if you ask me, you know, what is the main, uh, the most important thing in this course, other than the two chapters that we did on the Jesus teaching on faith, it would be this. I say, if you get this, you know, if you get this lesson here on Abraham's faith and how we should, you know, exercise faith in God, then, this is this is it because you're going to you and I are going to use this over and over and over again in our lives. That this is how we are going to exercise faith in God. This is what we do when we say have faith in God. Right. So um, I want us to uh, follow uh, this uh, this lesson very closely. I'm going to go ahead and uh, share the PDF which. Uh, has been put out for us. So this is lesson number six, Abraham, the father of faith. So in uh, Romans chapter four, um, verses 11 and 12, and uh, I'll, just, we'll just, I'll just do the introduction first, and then we will zero in on the main passage. In Romans chapter four, you know, verse 11 to 11, as, um, as Paul is speaking or writing about Abraham, uh, he says, uh, uh, Abraham, that he might be the father of all who believe. So Abraham is the father of all who believe, right? Uh, not just the Jews. Now, the Jewish people consider uh, Abraham and King David as their two patriarchs. So they look, at, look up to Abraham and King David, and that's wonderful. But here, the Romans chapter 4, verse 11 says, Abraham is the father of all who believe, whether Jews or Gentiles, all of us. He's the father of all who have faith. Right? And, uh, uh, and he's the father, it says here, of all who walk in the steps of the faith of Abraham. So we have to walk in the steps of the faith, which our father Abraham had. Right, so uh, uh, we want to follow Abraham's faith. You know, the Bible is saying you're walking in his steps. That means follow, just just follow his footsteps. Do it the way he did it. Walk the way he walked. You know, follow his example. So we walk in the steps of the faith of our father Abraham. So we want to understand. Uh, what happened in the life of Abraham. So just a quick overview of Abraham's life. Uh, some of us may be familiar uh, with his life recorded in the uh, book of Genesis, uh, you know, chapters 11 on to chapter 25. So what do we see? Uh, just a highlight of uh, Abraham's journey. Uh, God called him uh, to fulfill a divine plan. So God said, Abraham, I've got a, I've got, I've got a plan for you got an assignment on your life and uh, but I want you to follow me so God called him out and had a had a plan for his life and Abraham so we read that I read about that in Genesis 12 1 to 3 God said Abraham you are going to be the father of a nation you're gonna have a you're gonna have a huge nation come out of you uh, so uh, it meant that he had to have at least a son, um, a child through whom he could have, uh, you know, further descendants. But Abraham and Sarah, 
uh, and when God called Abraham at that time, was Abraham was about 75 years of, of age, and they had they still had no children because Sarah was barren, and now they were quite old. But God is coming to him at that point in his life and saying, you know, I'm going to I have a plan for you. Uh, I'm going to bring a great nation out of you, and I'm going to bless the nations of the earth. Now, Abra and, I, and I have a land for you. I have a place that I want to take you to. Right? So Abraham went out in faith and obedience. And as he journeyed with God, you know, Abraham didn't have a perfect life. Along the way, we see Abraham had doubts about the promise of God. He uh, even experienced, you know, we would say moral failure in the sense that twice he lied about his wife and he called her his sister just because uh, he wanted to protect his own life. Uh, he made mistakes along the way. So Abraham didn't have a perfect, flawless life. No, he was just like us. He made mistakes. Um, God even encouraged him, uh, you know, in, uh, uh, along the way, by giving him a clear picture of the promise. In uh, Genesis 15, there's a time when, you know, Abraham has been waiting uh, to have Abraham and Sarah have been waiting to have a child. Um, and, uh, you know, it's about 10 years since they began this journey of faith and no child yet. So in Genesis 15, uh, you know, God comes to Abraham and then Abraham complains to God. He says, God, you know, uh, we are still childless. Uh, you know, where is your promise? 10 years. Where is the promise? We are still childless. Uh, and then he begins to reason with God and say, well, did you mean somebody else was born in my house? Uh, you know, maybe through them, you know, I would have a, a, a big uh, family thereafter. Uh, you know, and so God had to say, Abraham, no, I meant you and Sarah. From both of you, I'm going to raise up a big nation. And so God tells Abraham, I want you to look at the stars in the sky. Of course, this was in the, the nighttime. Uh, Abraham looks up in the sky and he sees the stars and God says, that's how many descendants you're going to have. And he, you know, he paints a picture of the promise for Abraham. And Abraham, the Bible says, Abraham believed God and God said, that's it. That puts you in the right standing before me. When you believe, you're positioned to receive. When you believe, you are in a place of righteousness that means in a right standing before me when you're in that place of right standing you are ready to receive so abraham believed god genesis 15 verse 6 abraham believed god and god counted it to him for righteousness and says that's it you're in a right standing before me the other thing we see in abraham's journey is that you know god changes his identity and his speech so you know, God does things intentionally. It's, he doesn't do it at random or uh, at women fancy, but uh, very intentionally, God comes to him, Abraham, one day, and you read about this in Genesis 17, and says, Abraham, from today, I'm going to change. I want you to change your name and Sarah's name. So you're going to change your name from Abraham, Abraham, which means exalted father, to Abraham father of a multitude and you're going to change your wife's name from sarai which means princess or princely to sarah you're the princess of a multitude so he's saying change your name now obviously if you change your name you're going to change your speech because you're going to be calling the other by their new name so you know you could imagine abraham now starting to call his wife sarah princess of a multitude and Sarah, uh, Sarah now calling her husband Abraham father of a multitude and you can imagine them calling each other by this new name and uh, people all around them saying whoa well, what's going on here you know they've they, they're calling themselves as you know parents of a huge multitude and they don't, they don't even have a child not even one child but here they are, they're calling each other by this name, which speaks of, you know, uh, having many descendants. But God did it intentionally. So it's not only changing their identity, it's changing their speech. They're, they're, they're beginning to speak aligned to the word of God, to the promise of God. And this is the way that God told them, okay, you need to start speaking aligned to the promise. What I've called you, you begin to call yourself. Right? So he changed their name.
And then eventually we see uh, uh, after 25 years, uh, they have Isaac, Abraham, and Sarah have Isaac. So God works a miracle. He fulfills the promise, and they have their son, Isaac. Now, uh, it didn't, uh, Abraham's story doesn't stop there because subsequently, uh, about 12 years after that, after the birth of Isaac, God speaks to Abraham says, Abraham, I want you to take your son, your only son, Isaac, and I want you to go offer him as a sacrifice on a mountain that I'm going to show you. So this is Abraham's test of faith. And you read about that in Genesis 22. And uh, the Bible says, Abraham took Isaac and went up the mountain, was ready to offer him as a sacrifice. And uh, the New Testament, looking back, says Abraham did it because he believed that even if he offered Isaac as a sacrifice, God will raise him up. Because God had said, through Isaac, you will have descendants. In other words, Abraham was completely convinced. This is what God said. He will do it even if I have to offer Isaac as a sacrifice. So Abraham's eyes were still focused on God and his promise, not on the fulfillment. And uh, and when we come into the New Testament, the New, New Testament calls Abraham both a friend of God and the father of faith. Right. So this is a quick overview of Abraham's life. But what our goal is, our objective today is, we want to learn the steps of the faith of Abraham. This man, God said, you follow his life. You follow his example of faith. To all of us, he's saying, follow that man. Follow his example. Walk in his steps, the steps of faith. So we want to understand the steps that Abraham took in his journey of faith. Right? Now we know he didn't have a perfect life. He had doubts. He battled doubts. He made mistakes along the way. Uh, we know all of that. But let's look at the steps he took. Right? So I would request somebody to please read for us Romans chapter 4, verses 17 to 21. Romans 4, 17 to 21, please. Romans 4, 17 to 21. As it is written, I have made you a father of many nations in the presence of him whom he believed, God who gives life to the death and calls those things which do not exist as though they did, who contrary to hope in hope believed, so that he became the father of many nations according to what was spoken, so shall your descendants be. And not being weak in faith, he did not consider his own body already dead since he was about a hundred years old and the deadness of Sarah's womb. He did not waver at the promise of God through unbelief, but was strengthened in faith, giving glory to God and being fully convinced that what he had promised, he was able to perform. Amen. Thank you, John. So, this passage, Romans 4, 17 to 21, is really the Holy Spirit summarizing for us through Paul, the Apostle Paul is writing this. The Holy Spirit is summarizing for us Abraham's walk of faith in these five verses. You know, so you can imagine now Abraham's entire life was, is recorded for us in the Old Testament, Genesis chapters 11 to 25. And here the Holy Spirit in the New Testament is summarizing in a very concise way for us in these five verses, this is how Abraham walked in faith in order to receive the promise of God and follow his, and you and I must follow the steps of his faith, right? So, we are going to uh, try to understand the steps of Abraham's faith. And I've just, you know, for, for the benefit of our learning, I've uh, put it down in these simple points as number one, number two, number three, and so on, just for us to learn so that we can do the same thing in our lives, right? But let's begin by just looking at verse 17 uh, to understand something about God. It says here, uh, God gives life to the dead and calls things which don't exist as though they 
did. So it's talking about God, right? What about our God? Well, God gives life to the dead. So when God, so this is both with respect to Abraham and also with the way God works in your life and mine, right? So when God came to Abraham and said, Abraham, I'm going to make you the father of a big nation. You know, Abraham probably had stopped thinking uh, of even having a child a long time ago, may have stopped. Sarah, Sarah may have just, you know, let's said, okay, you know, I'm never going to have a child, I'm barren. And they probably have given up, you know, the any expectation of having children. It's like, okay, uh, they're going to be childless till we die. And here comes God and says, I'm going to make you the father of a great nation. So God gives life to the dead. What seems hopeless, God resurrects hope. God, you know, what is dead? God gives life. You know, so that's our God. And that's the way he works. Uh, and that's 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 what some you and I must be absolutely convinced of that if you know, it doesn't matter if things are dead, they seem hopeless, uh, they seem impossible. There's nothing impossible with God. And the way God works is he gives life to the dead. And not only that, but he calls things that do not exist as though they did. That means things that don't exist in, in your life and mine. You know, we say, okay, it's not there right now. It doesn't exist. There's no chance of it even coming into existence in my life. But God is the one who calls them into existence. It's come. When God calls it, they come. They come into being. He calls things that do not exist as though they did. So you and I are children of God. We are therefore imitators of God. And therefore you and I must, you know, walk this walk where we expect God to give life to things that are dead, where we call things that do not exist as though they did the way God does it. So we are imitators of God. We follow, we, we do what God does, right? So we believe God gives life to the dead. We believe God calls things that do not exist as they did. So we also do the same in our lives. Okay. So that's something as we co-work with God in order to receive his promises. Now, let's look at the steps of Abraham's faith. The first thing, very simple. Abraham believed God. So it says in verse 17, when God said, I have made you a father of many nations. So in the presence of him that is before God, it says, he whom he believed. So Abraham believed. He believed. He believed. What did Abraham believe? He believed the promise of God. So Abraham believed. He believed God. He believed that God gives life to the dead. He believed God calls things that don't exist. He calls them into being. Abraham believed. So the first step is that you and I believe. So we believe what God has promised. We believe our God. We believe that the God whom we follow is the God who gives life to the dead. For him, nothing is impossible. For him, if things don't exist today, he will get them in. Abraham believed God. So you and I, we believe God. And the God we believe in is the God who gives life to the dead. He's a God who calls what does not exist. He brings them into being. He, he causes them to come into being. So in your life and mine, things may not exist. It's like impossible. Uh, it's dead. But hey, we believe God. The God we believe in is a, he bring it in. He will cause it to come into being. 
So our first step is to believe God. Put complete trust. Put your faith completely in God, in his ability, in his faithfulness to fulfill his word, in his power to fulfill his word. We believe God. Second is this. Against all hope, in hope, he still believed. So that's the next verse, Romans 4, verse 18. It says, who contrary to hope, that means contrary to hope, that means uh, against all hope, when there is no reason to hope, when there's no reason to even have any hope, it is hopeless. It is without hope. Who contrary to hope, in hope, believe. That means he still chose to have hope. And he coupled hope with believing, with faith. So he chose to have hope. In hope, he still believed. Right? So, when there is no reason to hope, you and I must still hope. When there's no reason to have any kind of expectation, any kind of desire, you and I must still choose to be people who will have an expectation, who will have a desire for whatever God has promised. If it's in the Bible, you can have it. If it's a promise that God made for his people, you can have it. Even when there is no reason to have hope, you can have hope. You can have an expectation. You can have a longing, a desire, even when things seem hopeless. And with that, you couple faith. That means now, not only are you desiring something, you say, okay, I'm going to believe it. I'm going to believe God for this. Right? It says here, in hope he believed, so that he became the father of many nations according to what was spoken. So that's key. He, in hope, believed according to what was spoken. That means there's a promise of God. God had spoken something. So against all hope, in hope we believe because God has spoken. God has given us a promise. So first, we believe God. We believe in who God is. We believe his power. We believe his faithfulness. Second step is this. Look, even if there's no reason to hope, you still hope and you still believe because God has given you his word according to what God has spoken. According to what God has spoken. And in Abraham's case, God said, you're going to have many descendants. In your case, in my case, we will go with the word of God. Here, yeah, this Bible. The promise is here. And so what's in it, we will take a hold of and we will believe. Okay. And then number three, what was the third thing he did? Verse 19. And not being weak in faith, he did not consider his own body already dead since he was about 100 years old and the deadness of Sarah's womb. He did not consider not being weak in faith. He did not consider. That means he, he knew. He knew and he recognized that his body was pretty old. He was 100 years old. Sarah was barren. But he didn't let the circumstances weaken his faith. How? He chose not to consider those things. That means his focus was not on these facts. These were facts. Of course, his body he was pretty old. Abraham was old. Of course, Sarah was barren. But he didn't focus on that. Instead, of course, he focused on the promise of God. So that's our third step. 
We don't let our faith weaken by looking at the circumstances. We take our eyes off the circumstances, the situations, the facts, and put our eyes on the promise of God. So keep your eyes on the promise of God. You're not denying the facts. You're not denying, you know, the situation. Yeah, it is like this. Yeah, things are tough or things are rough, whatever. The, the situations are there, but you're not looking at those things. Because if you keep looking at it, what will happen? It's only going to weaken our faith. But instead of looking at those circumstances, we choose not to consider those circumstances. Instead, we choose to intentionally consider the promise of God. Keep your eyes on the promise. So that your faith is not weakened. So you start believing God for something in your life. You take a promise of God. Okay, let's take an example. Let's say... Here's a person who's seen a lot of failure in his life, one after the other, after the other. You know, he's tried his hand at this, it didn't work out. He tried his hand at that, it didn't work out. He tried his hand at another thing, it didn't work out. So, you know, he's gone through a series of failures in his life. And he's at this point where he's saying, look, you know, I, I don't think I'm ever going to succeed at anything. And so let's say this person gets saved. Uh, he believes in the Lord Jesus Christ. He's a, he's a child of God now. He starts reading his Bible. And uh, he comes to this place in Psalm, Psalm 1. It says, you know, blessed is the man who does not walk in the counsel of the ungodly. He does not... Uh, walk in the way of sinners, he doesn't sit in the seat of the scornful, uh, but his delight is in the law of the Lord, and in his law he meditates day and night. And then it says in Psalm 1 verse 3, he will be like a tree planted by the rivers of water. His leaf will not wither. He will bring forth his fruit in its season. Uh, his leaf will not wither, and whatever he does will prosper. He says, hey, that applies for every person who believes in the Lord. So it applies for me. I could take that promise. It's there in the Bible. And this verse is saying, Psalm 1 verse 3 says, I will be fruitful and whatever I do will prosper. So he takes a hold of that. So step one, he believes God. What about this God? He What about God? God gives life to the dead and calls things that do not exist as they did. It's okay, look, in my life, I've been a failure. Everything I tried has ended up in fail, in, in failure. But God can turn my failure into a success. Right now, there is no success. There is no success in my life. But God can bring into existence what doesn't exist. God can make me a success. So he believes God. Step two, against all hope, he still believes. So is there any reason for him to believe that he would become a success in life? No, because up until that point, life has been a series of failures. Everything has just failed. So he's totally hopeless, speaking naturally. But against all hope, he still believes. Because God has spoken in his word that you will be like a tree planted by rivers of water. You will bring forth your fruit in its season. Your leaf will not wither and whatever you do will prosper. So I believe that. That's for me. I'm going to do what Psalm 1 says. I'm going to delight myself in God and his word. And I will be like that tree. Fruitful. Flourishing. Prospering. So against all hope he believes. And then he, you know, he starts doing something. 
you know, whatever he, he has, you know, whatever he has skills in, whatever he, so he puts his hand to the work, uh, to work. But this time he's doing it differently. This time he's doing it, believing God, that God will bring into existence what does not exist, that God will give life to what is dead, that against all hope he believes. So this time I will be a success because God said it in his word. So against all hope, he believes. Now, of course, when he starts doing that, his mind starts playing games, right? His mind starts telling him, hey, all these years, you've tried all these things and every single one of them has failed. Why is it going to be different this time? What makes you think you're going to be a success now? How, how is it going to change? So his mind might play games, but then he chooses not to consider history. He chooses not to consider his past failures. Instead, he says, I'm going to keep my eyes on the promise. The promise says, I will be like a tree planted by the rivers of water. I will bring forth my fruit in its season. My leaf will not wither, and whatever I do will prosper. I keep my eyes on that promise. So he refuses to let his faith be weakened by, you know, the, the history. You know, he may have had, you know, a series of failures, and that keeps coming up, but he says, I'm not, I'm not going to let that dictate my faith. I'm not going to consider the past failures. I'm going to look at the promise of God. I will not let my faith be weakened. Okay. So that's step three as we are journeying. Right. So what must we do to keep your faith strong? Focus on God and his promise, not on the circumstances. Pay attention. To God's word. Keep your eyes focused on the word. Keep looking at the promise of God over and over and over again. Right. Step four. What else do we see in Abraham's journey or journey of faith or steps of faith? It says there in Romans 4 verse 20, he did not waver at the promise of God through unbelief unbelief. That means he didn't let unbelief come in and cause him to waver at the promise of God. Now, unbelief, if you just look at it in the Greek, it is apistia. Uh, so the, the word pistia means faith. Apistia means the absence of faith. So unbelief is simply the absence of faith faith. So he refused to let go of his faith. When we let go of faith, or the absence of faith, that is faithlessness, or that is unbelief. And what, what will it cause us to do? It will cause us to waver at the promise of God. So you choose not to let go of the promise of God. You choose to hold on tightly to the promise of God with your faith. So your faith is locked in to the promise. Nothing is going to take that grip off. So think of our example. So here's this man. He's at work. And, uh, you know, um, He's believing God to succeed and, uh, you know, and maybe the first few weeks, nothing seems to be very different. So thoughts come to his mind, hey, what's going on? It's been a couple of weeks and things don't look any different from previous times. Sure, looks like you're, you're going to fail again. Maybe his old friends come by and they ask him, what are you doing now? And he says, you know, look, I've started a new business. And they start laughing. They say, man, we've heard you, you know, you started 10 different businesses in the past and they've all failed. And why are you trying again? 
Now, that's not going to help his faith in any way. It's going to, you know, uh, cause him to doubt things. But he makes a choice. I'm not going to waver at the promise of God through unbelief. I'm not going to let them anything rob me of my faith. I'm not going to let anything cause me to become faithless. Instead, I'm going to tighten my hold on the promise of God by faith. So he locks in by faith on the promise of God. So he, so we can, you know, rephrase this sentence here. He did not be able the promise of God through unbelief. We can restate it like this. He held on tightly to the promise of God through faith. He held on tightly to the promise of God through faith. So what's step four? He held on tightly to the promise of God through faith. Even when doubts and all kinds of things were coming and hitting against his mind, he's holding on tightly to the promise of God through faith. Situations may not change immediately. People may come and say all kinds of things. I know all those uh, things that can cause us to be doubtful, they're coming at us, but you're holding on tightly to the promise of God through faith. Or oh, your faith has locked in to the promise of God. Step four. You're not going to quit. He keeps looking at the promise. God said, I will be like a tree planted by the rivers of water. I will bring forth my fruit in its season. My leaf will not wither. Whatever I do will prosper. That's it. Well, God said it. I believe it. I'm not, I'm not going to let go of my promise. It doesn't matter if three weeks have gone and I haven't seen a result yet. If four weeks have gone and I haven't seen any changes yet. It doesn't matter if my friends come and make fun of me that, you know, past 10 businesses I tried, failed, whatever, you know. doesn't matter. I'm not letting go of the promise. I'm holding on tightly to the promise of God through faith. Number four. Then, what else did Abraham do? He was strengthened in faith, giving glory to God. He was strengthened in faith. How? Giving glory to God. Well, that means giving praise, honor, worship to God. So instead of being weakened in his faith through unbelief, he chose to do this. He chose to become stronger in his faith by giving praise to God. Now, how exactly he did it, you know, doesn't matter. He, he would have done it in his way, you know, however he knew to praise God and thank God. But, you know, I can just imagine Abraham must have come to this place. And he said, Father, thank you that you are God. You are faithful. You are the God who gives life to the dead. You are the God who calls things that don't exist into existence. I praise you, Father. And uh, you're the God who gives me descendants like the stars in the sky and like sand on the seashore. Oh, God, I thank you. God, I praise you. As far as I'm concerned, God, your promise is done. It's settled because you're a faithful God. You know, he could have just done it that way or he could, uh, I don't know, he could sing songs or however, but he gave glory to God. He praised God. So, of course, he was praising God in the context of being strengthened in faith. And so here's the key. That even before you see the promise fulfilled, you start giving glory to God. You start thanking Him. You start praising Him. You start worshipping Him for fulfilling the promise. So, Father, thank you for doing this. Thank you. You, you, just, you are in the fulfillment of the promise even before you receive the fulfillment of the promise. That means you, by faith, you have stepped into it. You've come into this place where you say, God, for me, it's done. I thank you for it. 
I praise you for it. Why? Because you are God, you are faithful, you will not fail, your word will not fail, and you are God who gives life to the dead. You are God who calls things that don't exist as though they did. God, so I thank you this is done. Praise you that it is done. I worship you that it is done. So what's happening? While he's giving glory to God, his faith is being strengthened. He's becoming stronger and stronger in faith. So you can imagine in our example, you know, this young, this man, as he has started his 11th business, so to speak, in you know, this example, he starts praising God. You know, it's maybe three months into the business. Maybe things may not have changed much yet, but he's beginning to praise God. Father, I thank you that according to your word, I am like a tree planted by rivers of water. I thank you that I bring forth my fruit in its season, that my leaf does not wither and whatever I do prospers. I thank you, Heavenly Father, for doing this. Thank you that you fulfill it. Thank you that this is done for me, God. I thank you it is done. So he begins to thank God. He begins to praise God. And while he praises God, while he worships God for the fulfillment of the promise, he is being strengthened in faith. He may come morning after morning, opening up his, you know, shop or his business, and doesn't seem to be very different from the previous months, but he's still thanking God. Lord, I thank you for business flowing in. God, I thank you for causing my business to be profitable. God, I thank you for causing my business to be a success, God. Thank you that you are faithful to your word. Thank you that you make everything I do prosper. He's giving glory to God. And as he gives glory to God, he's being strengthened in his faith. So Abraham, a strengthened in faith, giving glory to God. So we thank him in advance, right? So it's not, you know, we thank him even before we see the fulfillment of the promise. We start praising him, we start thanking him for it. And what happens? Last step. He came into this place, number six, where he was fully convinced, Romans 4.21, I'm being fully convinced, fully convinced that what he had promised, he was also able to perform. So as Abraham took these steps, what happened? He came to this place where he was fully convinced. I mean, like, there's no doubt now that I'm it's all settled. Fully convinced. What God promised, he'll perform. What God promised, he will perform. What God promised, he will perform. What God said, he will do. It's done. Fully convinced. Nothing could shake. And God said, you know, it, that's where you know, God wants you and me to be. To be in that place where we are fully convinced that what God has promised, he will perform. It may take time. It's okay. We may make some mistakes along the way. It's okay. You get back on your feet. Go along. Keep going. We may have some doubts along the way. Abraham did. But you get up, shake your doubts off, keep going. Until you and I come to that place where we are fully convinced God promised he will do. And at that moment, when he was in that place where he was fully convinced, the promise came forth. The fulfillment of the word came forth. Right? So what we've seen is from Romans 4, chapter 4, verses 17 to 21, we've just broken down this passage to highlight Abraham's steps of faith. This is what this is the journey Abraham made in his faith in God. And this is how you and I are going to take a hold of the promise. Every promise, this is how we're going to do it. Okay. So 
we'll take a break and we're going to come back. And I want to go over this again and just show you, this is how you apply uh, your faith to receiving the promise of God for your life. Okay. And uh, this, this is very simple, but it's so important. And this is how we're going to use, the, these are the steps we're going to take to see the promise of God fulfilled. Okay. Um, any questions before we go for break? Okay. I think uh, everyone's fine. Okay. All right. So let's take a quick break, 10 minute break, and we will be back and we continue this. Thank you. <laughs> 